Hello students, welcome to BBA 204 Principles of Management. Today I will be covering part 2 of chapter 2 which is about the history of management thinking. So So far we have covered three major perspectives, right? The classical perspective, the scientific approach under the classical perspective, and also the humanistic perspective. So in part two, I will be covering the quantitative perspective, which is also referred to as management science. This perspective emerged after World War II, applying math, statistics, and other quantitative techniques to managerial problems, and also to aid management decision-making. This approach basically consists of two subfields, operations research and operations management. Under operations research, we have, uh, we have the field that consists of using math and statistics and other applications of quantitative techniques to managerial problems. On the other hand, operations management refers to the field of management that specializes in the physical production of goods and services using management science to solve manufacturing problems. So, whereas operations research is more research-oriented, right? It uses math and statistics and other applications of quantitative techniques to managerial problems whereas operations management is more managerial. It's more management-oriented because it specializes in the physical production of goods and services using the management science to solve management problems. In other words, as you can clearly see here, the difference between operations research and operations management is such that operations research is more about analyzing, collecting data, doing the analysis, uh, you know, collecting information about the user profiles and so forth, and analyzing the results uh, of the statistical outcomes, whereas the operations management is more about managing and controlling the actual production of goods and services. Some of the more commonly used methods in operation research are forecasting, inventory modeling, linear and nonlinear programming, weighting theory, scheduling, simulation, and break-even analysis. Of course, uh, under the quantitative perspective, we also use the information technology which focuses on technology and software to aid managers. It is the most recent subfield of management science and often reflected in management information systems. Okay? So, so information technology focuses on technology and software to aid managers. It, IT helps managers estimate costs, plan and track production, manage projects, and allocate resources or schedule employees. Most uh, of the organizations uh, in the workplace have departments of IT specialists, right? Everywhere, almost everywhere, in every sector or industry of the economy, in every sector of the economy. Now companies are hiring IT specialists to help them apply quantitative techniques to complex and organizational problems. And then we also hire quants. I mean, quants are uh, often referred to as financial managers who base their decisions on complex quantitative analysis, right? So basically, quants work at investment firms, investment banks, or accounting firms, right? 
trying to focus on or base their decisions on complex quantitative analysis in order to resolve managerial problems. Okay, so let's look at the recent trends, right, uh, in managerial thinking. The recent trends are somewhat extensions of the human resource perspective, which include system thinking, the contingency view, and total quality management, okay? So these recent trends are broadly defined or classified under the human resource perspective. Don't forget, human resource perspective is a subfield of the humanistic perspective, okay? And then under the humanistic perspective, we have the human resource perspective, and then we have three more subfields under the human resource perspective, the system thinking, the contingency view, and the total quality management. So basically, in system thinking, it's a very overall approach. Uh, you know, it's the perspective that, that, uh, that sees the distinct elements of a system or situation and the complex and the changing interaction among those elements. Okay, so, so systems thinking is all about the, you know, thinker's ability, the researcher's ability, or the manager's ability to see the distinct elements of a situation as well as the complexities. So basically, a system, we have to look at the system as a whole, which is a set of interrelated parts that function as a whole to achieve a common purpose, right? A company is a system. It involves a system and it has interrelated parts that function as a whole. Each department has its own individuality, right? Uh, has its own goals and objectives and rules and regulations, like management department is independent of the accounting department. Accounting is independent of the sales department. But each of these departments has parts that are related to one another in order to achieve a common purpose, okay? The marketing department needs the accounting department to be able to do forecasting about the budget needed to undertake marketing projects, right? So therefore, all of these departments are mutually dependent on each other because they're part of the system, um, which is the company itself. Okay, so basically, um, what is the basic advantage or the use of systems theory? System thinking enables managers to look for patterns of movement over time and focus on the qualities or rhythm, flow, direction, shape, and networks of relationships that accomplish the performance of the whole company. There are also subsystems, right, within the system. Those are the parts of the system that are all interconnected, right? And then we assume that, we assume that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And managers must be able to, you know, understand the subsystems to look for the circles of causality and help allocate the resources using a systems approach. So this whole systems approach is based on the the notion of synergy. For instance, think about the CUNY system. The CUNY system, our university system, is a system, right? And it has subsystems, which are the individual campuses, right? Lehman College, Hunter College, Baruch, those are the subsystems. But all of these subsystems are somewhat related to each other, and they all operate because of the synergy, synergy that they have right because the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts right so if the system fails this is the first question that we need to ask what did go wrong in the system so so think about the financial crisis that we had in 2008 the whole banking and the financial system collapsed right so what were the causes of failure in the system so you need to look at the financial system as a whole 
including its subsystems, right? The key players in it and the relationships among those subsystems, right? So, so, uh, so basically, the systems thinking is a very, very important approach. It's also a kind of uh, a functional approach to managerial problems in the workplace. Uh, it seems to be a very effective approach because the manager seems to be looking for patterns of movement over time and focus on the qualities or rhythm, flow, direction, shape, and network of relationships that accomplish the performance of the whole system. Here are the circles of causality, how the circles of causality allow the managers to discern circles of behavior or causality between different parts. So understanding the circles of causality, like understanding the cause and effect relationship, enable the managers to allocate or distribute resources in the most efficient and effective way. Okay. And then we have the second subfield, which is the contingency view under the human resource perspective, right? So under the first approach was the systems thinking, and the second approach under the human resource perspective is the contingency view, basically arguing that every situation in the world of management is unique. There is really no standard for management. Instead, management depends on the situation itself, okay? There is really no standard or universal guideline for how managers should behave or manage in the workplace. Instead, their acts depend on the situation. Managers must determine what methods will work under particular circumstances. Therefore, managers must be able to identify key contingencies for the current situation. So our job as managers is to search for, right, is to search for uh, important contingencies in our industries, technologies, environments, and international cultures. Therefore, we can identify patterns and characteristics of our organizations. And as a result, we can fit solutions to those characteristics. We can fit solutions to those unique circumstances and situations. For example, take the example of Chipotle at one point, right? Chipotle, uh, even prior to, to COVID-19, they were facing severe employee turnover, meaning that people just they came, they left, you know, there was a very high employee turnover. How would you approach the problem from the contingency perspective, right? So basically, the contingency theory's response would be that there is no easy and single answer when dealing with employees, right? Chipotle needs to figure out what exactly is causing the employee turnover. Right. Do the employees have problems with their managers? Do the employees have a problem uh, with anything in the company at that particular point in time? So it is really up to Chipotle to figure out what is exactly causing the employee turnover at that particular point in time. It may, it may have nothing to do with the uh, work satisfaction or dissatisfaction. So we really need to look at the situation, particular situations or contingencies uh, that lead to high employee turnover. So if we can find important patterns or characteristics uh, in a certain time frame, we can always fit solutions also to those characteristics. Okay.
So in other words, contingency view stresses that there is really no easy and single answer to problems because every situation is unique and depends on the context. Okay? Therefore, it is important to anticipate opposing viewpoints and respond to those points fairly and adequately. There is really no best way. There is really no best way or the universal way or the standard to organize a corporation or lead a company. Okay, so because every situation is unique. So it's sort of like every situation is relative to the other. It's a relativistic point of view as opposed to universalist view, which says that, oh, there is one best way. That a scientific approach argues that you know, the workers can be retooled like machines. The main focus in the workplace is to increase the efficiency and productivity. Right? If you divide the labor in the most efficient and the productive way, you know, uh, the, 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 the companies can easily produce at the maximum level. They can produce at the optimal level and the maximum level and therefore can make a profit. Okay, whereas the contingency view is totally different because it has the relativistic point of view or the case view, case view, saying that every situation is unique. There may be times that the companies fail to make profits and we need to be able to look into the context of why this is happening. Okay. And then we have, finally, the, 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 the third approach is the total quality management. Right? The total quality management perspective focuses on managing the total organization to deliver the best quality to customers. Right? So this movement is strongly associated with Japan. Um, basically, initially, the United States focusing too much on or excessively on the classical perspective, the scientific approach, Fordism. So we kind of ignored the ideas of Edwards Deming, who was the father of the quality movement. But Deming, uh, interestingly, was embraced in Japan, which then became the world's second industrial power after the United States. So total quality management became really popular in the 1980s and 1990s, which when it became popular, it led to the, to the development of Japan. Because Japan was totally destroyed after World War II due to the US intervention, atomic bombing, and then uh, a number of policies were adopted by Japan to restructure and to reorganize the economy. Therefore, because of the destruction taking place after World War II, Japanese had to devise new methods to rebuild the society and the economy from scratch and as a whole, and therefore improve quality. Okay, okay. Therefore, they started adopting the ideas of Edwards Deming. Okay, so Japan emphasized employee involvement in the prevention of quality problems. Okay, so there are four significant elements in the total quality management approach. Employee involvement, this is all about company-wide participation in the quality control. Especially frontline workers are intimately involved in the process of total quality management. Okay, so the first part, the employee involvement, really emphasizes the importance of the frontline workers. Okay, and then the second one is the focus on the customer. This is all about what the customer wants, what they value. Benchmarking is a process whereby companies find out how others do something better or and imitate or improve it. So we, while uh, trying to improve the quality management in our company, we always look for 
or 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 try to find a benchmark in the the industry that benchmark is generally the most powerful player and the most successful player in our industry right so if i were a startup company an it startup company or startup software company i would look for a benchmark the most successful company in the in our field it might be the microsoft it might be the, it might be the apple uh, right so, so so we're always looking for a benchmark the most successful and the powerful player in our industry to find out how we can do something better by imitating the benchmark or or uh, learning from, from from benchmarks innovations okay And of course, the final approach is the, the continuous import, improvement, right? The final emphasis of the total quality management is the continuous improvement, which Im involves the implementation of small incremental improvements in all areas of the organizations on an ongoing basis. So basically, in this chapter, we discuss different management ideas in an effort to trace their historical roots or in an effort to trace their roots to different historical perspectives, right? In the field of management, new ideas continue to emerge to meet the changing and the difficult times that we are going through right now, such as COVID-19. Although history is always a lesson for managers, managers need to look for fresh and current ideas to help us cope during difficult times because we also need to be innovative to be able to, 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 to meet the changing needs of those difficult times. The shelf life of trends is getting shorter and the new ideas peak in fewer than three years. Therefore, we as managers need to be always be prepared to, to, uh, to face any problem and also be ready to uh, resolve those problems using those ideas from the history of management thinking. So far, thank you for listening to my lecture, and uh, in the next lecture, I will be talking about Chapter 3, which is all about the business environment and corporate culture. Thanks again for listening to my lecture so far, and see you in Chapter 3. Have a good day. Bye-bye.